right? All right. So um, good afternoon, everyone. And I guess morning, evening for anybody who's remote. Um, so I'll be talking about confidential compute and present some of the discussions that are ongoing right now um, in RISC V um, and what, what we sort of need to you know, bring in this sort of functionality for RISC V platforms. So I'll touch upon some of like the non-ISA discussions we're having in RISC V terminology, also some of the ISA discussions we've started, um, and then also other platform recommendations and guidelines that would be required to implement such a capability. Um, and yeah, just a quick acknowledgement to a bunch of other reverse colleagues and also folks in the RISC V technical work groups that we work with um, that a um, lot, of, lot of other folks are contributing to. So a quick background for folks who attended the confidential compute mini con uh, micro conference today morning, probably this is a little bit repetitive, but I think it's good to quickly baseline, right? So we're, we're aiming, this particular discussion is aimed at the security property of running workloads with co high confidentiality right, on a platform. And what that means is relying on some hardware-based capabilities so that the fact that you're running a workload as, as a confidential workload can actually be proven to a remote relying party. And the other aspect is you have to attest to a particular trusted computing base to that remote relying party, right? So, so we'll talk about some of the TE properties and how far we can go in terms of reducing that trusted computing base on the platform. Typically, what uh, what confidential computing tries to do is reduce your remove your host, you know, other software entities on the on the platform. The starting assumption is you know you're talking about a multi security domain platform, so there is more than one um, entity operating on that system, where there may be a host software entity that's managing VMs or processes or containers, and there's like tenants running on it, which are the actual VMs themselves, for example. So we try to like make sure the VMs can run confidential or the containers can run confidential and keep the hosts outside the, the TCB. And that includes you know, developers, operators, anybody who has an influence on that, that host software. Um, so there's a pretty exhaustive threat model. I won't go through it uh, here. Um, right now, but you can sort of look, take a quick glance at it. Uh, this is documented in some of the draft discussions that we started. Um, a lot of the other uh, architectures that have sort of these are sorts of capabilities address all or parts of this similar threat model, right? So some of the quick ones to point out is obviously when we are talking about keeping things outside your TCB, you want to make sure any accesses from that untrusted software or hardware is kept outside the TCB, and that means you know, keeping data confidential, ensuring the integrity of the code that's executing in your workload, right? Also preventing tamper from other, other elements, right? Uh, so there's confidentiality requirements, there's integrity requirements, and then there is some other sort of auxiliary requirements that come from the fact that your platform might be in different postures. It might be in debug mode, it may be in a production mode. So when it's in a debug mode of operation, you might want to make sure you are using a separate key hierarchy so that you're not like divulging your customer secrets while the platform is allowed to be in, in debug mode and so on. Um, some other critical uh, threat model requirements are on attestation. Like I said, you know, confidential computing is sort of uh, for for uh, not if you're not doing any sort of attestation. So, so can I just ask about your threat models? You don't mention encryption there. So is data encryption going to be imp an important part of your confidential computing base? I know for trust zone, it's basically an isolation model. And IBM 360 has the same thing. But ARM is thinking they're also going to move to an encrypted model because Intel does it and it's shiny as far as I can tell. Is Risk Five wanting to do the same thing? Um, so we want to call out some of the in, in this threat model, we didn't want to say you should, you sh thou shall do this or that, right? We wanted to sort of call out like, here's the confidentiality and integrity requirements that we, we want to support, but how you actually implement it on your platform is really up to the threat model of that risk five platform that, that is trying to meet. So you might have a threat model where you say, hey, I'm not trying to prevent against hardware attacks. So for me, an MMU based access control model is sufficient for confidentiality, right? That, that is okay. Whereas somebody might say, no, I'm in an environment where it's an edge appliance like device and I want to prevent all kinds of hardware attacks on it, including some advanced side channel attacks and then your requirements are that much more. So you'll sort of, sort of see that nuance in the architecture where we try to separate the architectural mechanisms and interfaces from the implementation, right? And how far they go to meet that threat model, right? Yeah, go ahead. 
Um, I, I was just told by Krista that they're working on getting WorldGuard actually open source. So that's an implementation of stuff and it will have to be reconciled because this stuff wasn't done at the time they put that together. Um, but that, that's sort of an example. That's right. Yeah. Thanks. So um, here's just a sort of a, a reference architecture presentation or, or the, the, the model that we've been discussing in the, in the, in the RISC-5 technical uh, um, working group. So the working group is called, uh, the task group is called APTE or Application Program, uh, Processor, Trusted Execution Environment. Um, and this is a reference architecture that you'll see different deployment model mappings on in a, in a second. But I wanted to sort of call out some key properties here that uh, we, we are using as a, as a starting point. So we are, here our, our main goal is to meet sort of rich OS uh, environments, right? So um, a couple of ISA aspects that we're relying on here is first of all, we rely on the, on the hypervisor extension. So and that's a design choice that, I'll, that we, we made here as a starting point to basically say that we can support the notion of running a confidential VM. The advantage we have if we support the confidential VM model that we can we can support sort of your user mode and your supervisor mode virtualized, right? And that gives sort of the most freedom in terms of software to run different kinds of uh, workloads in this confidential environment. And uh, and then to be to be able to achieve that, there's a there's a couple of layers here that you can see, and I'll talk about the the hardware. Sort of guidelines at the at the bottom in a second. Um, what what these layers are essentially achieving is some key properties to essentially keep a large part of the host software out of the TCP, right? So as you can see here, as an example, we are so showing a, a platform that has uh, that is supporting virtualization itself. It's a host OS and an OS uh, VMM environment. So think of this as Linux KVM as as a, as a prime example, um, and is running a bunch of non-confidential ordinary VMs, right? On the same platform, we also want to be able to host confidential VMs. So, so this model is showing a, a peer model of a new entity called a TE security monitor, right? Which is basically, in this example, RISC V uh, macro code running in hypervisor extension mode or HS mode um, of the of the platform or, the, or of the CPU, um, and it exposes two interfaces. One is uh, called the the TH ABI, right? That's the um, the the interface between the host OS software that's managing the workloads, and then the TE security monitor itself. And then the second interface is the, the TG ABI, which is uh, meant to be used by the confidential workloads themselves. The, the reason for sort of this sort of partitioning is so that we can meet that design property that we want to uphold, which is keep all the resource management role still with the host OS or the VMM, which is really the operator on the, the platform, right? So we want to make sure that one of and, and you'll see this in our threat model as well. We want to make sure that just like regular multi-tenant uh, platforms, a tenant should never be able to do cause a denial of service on the on the host platform, right? And for that purposes, we want to make sure that the host OS or VMM is always in in control of the the resources on the platform and is able to make decisions about allocations and things like that. At the same time, we want to make sure that that host OS is not in control of the security properties we want to enforce. And that's why you see this TE security monitor here that's called out as a TCB element on the platform, right? Um, and that's the one that, that says, hey, the host OS can still manage the resources, but when a particular resource is running as a confidential workload, that host OS or software does not have access to the secrets associated with that workload, right? And it cannot influence the workload in a, in a way to cause its secrets to be leaked. Right? Um, now, to be able to achieve this sort of peer model separation that you see here, we have some TCB elements that we that we host um, in this in this picture in this M mode firmware, and that's basically called as the TSM driver, right? Um, and so the THABI, which is shown as a logical interface here, and we'll talk about the interface um, in in the in the plumbing details, is basically achieved through uh, e call um, um, in, intrinsic that is present in the RISC five privilege ISA, right? So the e call allows the uh, host OS to essentially invoke services from the TSM. The T TSM driver ensures that that context switch happens securely, right? So that the TSM itself is isolated on that, that platform, right? That's sort of the first part. And that's what this dashed line is trying to show, right? That there's a first level isolation for confidentiality and integrity between the, the TE and the non-TE memory. And then the non-TE, um, and the TE memory is then partitioned by the TSM essentially using the existing ratified privileged ISA H extension of RISC-V, because we can start using 
the standard first level and second level paging structure uh, and MMU enforcement to essentially do that uh, next level of, uh, of partitioning. Um, and there's a couple of deployment models that, that I mentioned are possible here, depending on how you how you want to run run things on the on the platform. Right? Um, and then last but not the least, there are a bunch of uh, dependencies on the platform itself uh, that uh, are 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 not mandated per the per the specification um, because we want to really focus on the non-ISA interfaces. But there are some guidelines we want to put forward in terms of hey, if if since the TSM is is in your TCB. Right, we have some explicit guidelines on how you should use some sort of a hardware-based platform root of trust to extend that in the measurements of that TCB, right? So that you can support attestation models um, using frameworks like TCG Dice um, when you when you're actually you know validating whether you're running the right confidential workload based on the right TCB. Um, some of the other elements that are called out here, as as uh, uh, James asked earlier, you may be using just like very basic MMU-like capabilities for isolation. Or you might have memory controllers that go much further ahead in terms of encryption, integrity, replay protection capabilities, and that's really a platform ingredient property, right? Uh, and that's really where we call, sort of call out some guidelines that hey, if you want to really protect against these kinds of threats, you might want to think about these kinds of capabilities. Right? And then the IMMU is called out again from a completeness perspective that for some of the basic meeting some of the basic threat model, you might want to think about keeping devices outside the TCB. And then we can talk about what is the mechanisms to bring specific devices back into the TCP, right, as needed. So that's sort of a baseline. Um, and here's sort of the, the couple of different deployment models that, uh, you know, we can reason about with that, with that base architecture, right? Um, in both of these cases, the interfaces that we talked about, the THABI and the TGABI, would largely be the same, right? It's just like different uh, manifestations of how the TSM could be implemented. Like, for example, here, the TSM is implemented to essentially completely, uh, you know, occupy HS mode or run is the only TCB element running in HS mode. So you can run the host device essentially in VS mode, um, and you can simply, um, you know, start building something like this just based on the existing privileged uh, uh, hypervisor extension today, right? With with these interfaces, obviously you still have to, you know, provide the the measurement and the attestation capabilities even on even on this platform. Uh, whereas this is sort of the model I described on the on the other file, where if you want a, a system where the host OS still retains control of the physical platform directly, right, with with uh, interactions only with the with the M mode firmware, and and you can support a peer based model. In in both cases, the THABI essentially is the one that interacts uh, allows these two entities to interact. In this model, obviously, you have some more some more requirements on the platform, and I'll describe that in a minute, right? Like because you have to sort of partition this peer software running in HS mode, whereas in this case, you really only have your TCB elements in HS, in HS mode, right? So that's sort of the, the, the background. Um, let, me, let me pause here and, and take any questions before I go into sort of the, the discussion part on the, on the different uh, interface aspects. Will there be any ISA changes in order to support this? Yeah, so um, in, in this deployment model here, um, the, the one that we're seeing on the right, we have some ISA um, um, extensions that we're talking about. And really, they, they boil down to not, we don't think we need any new um, instructions per se. What we really need is definition in the architecture for new physical memory attributes, right? So we want to introduce this notion of a confidential memory attribute, right? So this file already has a definition of physical memory attributes. Where we want to add add this new type, right? To explicitly call out that uh, the the notion of what does it mean for software to manage this attribute on on memory, um, and as you'll see in the interface, we then have a model that the interface talks to of like how do you convert memory on a platform, or, and, and ideally all of the memory available on the platform from non-confidential to confidential, right? Um, and the platform mechanisms in turn like memory encryption and others can can back up that notion right so you can you can have you might have some memory for example that is behind a memory controller that supports encryption and that would be the the sort of your regions of memory that could support that physical memory attribute right um and and you, the te tsm will enforce that tes are always using memory assigned from those pools of of memory right so that's sort of the isa isa extension mark to, to answer in a nutshell Okay, 
Um, so in terms of the the plumbing, um, and I have a sort of a, a like a life cycle chart la later on that sort of describes the use of this uh, this interface. So as I said, the THABI is an interface that we want to expose from the TSM to the host software, right? And these are sort of on the left hand side. You see some of the intrinsics that we would need for host software to invoke into the TSM to be able to manage confidential VMs, right? Um, so just quickly running through some of the key ones here. Um, we expect some enumeration interfaces right at the top, where which will allow the, the host software on the platform to first discover the fact that this platform supports this capability, and then come in and uh, also get some information about uh, what, what the actual capabilities are on the platform. Right? For example, you might have implementations that require a certain amount of memory to be carved out for a TVM before it is launched. Right? And this is for holding things like the, depending on the number of vCPUs associated with that VM, you know how much memory do you need for those vCPU structures or other paging structures for associated with that uh, that VM. Um, a couple of the other intrinsics talk about uh, creating or destroying TVMs. So the idea behind this model is that the the first set of intrinsics allow a host software to essentially convert some amount of memory into confidential memory, and the next set of interfaces allow that host to assign resources to a TVM for execution by select allocating from that confidential memory, right? And the TSM, on, on the other hand, only enforces the intrinsics that that, that confidential memory regions are carved out and, and allocated exclusively to specific TVMs, right? So that allows us to systematically build the context structures in confidential memory for those TVMs, right? And that's what some of the initial um, set of intrinsics uh, um, achieve. And then once, uh, um, uh, one other one I wanted to point out, like these two interfaces here, um, adding measured pages or adding clear pages, right? This is uh, to essentially support the notion of attestation. So as we are building the TVMs and, and uh, the TVM is having memory is being assigned um, and the host is adding memory to that uh, TVM, we want to support at least these two classes of memory, right? One where you're adding, adding code or data you know, binary images that that might be your initial kernel image, init RD, et cetera, firmware image that are part of the measured, static measured image of that TVM, right? And that's what we want to support in the, to support the basic attestation model, right? Um, but to support different kinds of workload, we don't expect to measure the entire TVM on that first get go, right? There might be only a, a bootstrap part of uh, the TVM that you would measure as part of the static image, and then a larger part of the memory might be granted to the TVM once it starts executing, right? So, so that, that's why we have sort of these two classes of uh, um, a memory assignment, one which is explicitly measured, and the measurements of that are recorded by the TSM when, when the, before the TVM starts executing, and others that are added lazily as the, the TVM starts executing. Um, I won't touch upon some of these other ones because they are more sort of advanced where we can, we can discuss that more on the, on the list for as the TVM is executing, you probably want to support intrinsics like, um, you know, where you, where you fragment the, the, the page mapping or you come condense the page mapping in order to use the, the TLB based on the implementation more efficiently. Um, and then these are a couple of other uh, intrinsics, like uh, once you've instantiated a TVM that way, right? So you, you've select, you've granted it some memory, donated some memory to it from confidential memory regions, right? Um, and you've completed the measurement process, right? There is a there is sort of an intrinsic you invoke in the TSM to sort of finalize the measurements of that TVM, right? At that point, the TVM essentially becomes runnable, right? Um, and these intrinsics that you see here are to basically execute a TVM vCPU you know, uh, context. So this would be when KVMs, you know, and the kernel selects a particular context to execute, right? Those KVM, uh, you know, flows would essentially invoke um, these intrinsics into the, the TSM to be able to actually instantiate a, a vCPU context. And so this is where that partitioning that I was describing earlier comes in, where once you made the memory confidential, all host accesses to that confidential memory are, are prevented by the, by the platform. And we'll see some of the intrinsics to be able to do that. And when you enter a vCPU, that's when the TSM actually performs the context switch of that, uh, you know, to load that virtual CPU state onto that physical CPU. Right, and that virtual CPU state is stored in confidential memory. Right, so that's how the TSM ensures that even though the scheduling decisions are made by the host OS or, or KVM, 
the actual uh, isolation of the context is enforced by the by the TSM. Right? Um, and I'm not listing some of the other SBI uh, interfaces here that we would need for other aspects like securing inter, uh, IRQs or, or binding IRQ files to specific CPUs, um, things like you know uh, binding specific uh, device functions to them, um, or other other aspects that for which we will need potentially other SBI SBI calls. Um, so, so here's sort of yeah yeah is there a question? Yeah, you um, you mentioned one of those has a mechanism for measuring memory when you add it. What is your definition of what's your idea of measurement? What, yeah. what does the measurement go into? When can you change the measurement? How do you yeah. quote the measurement? Yeah, that's a good good question. So. The idea behind measurement is what we want to capture there is basically think of it as like a cryptographic hash of the contents of memory um, along with the mappings associated that are used for where that memory is placed with regards to that that guest's uh, guest physical address right so those are a couple of the properties we want to capture as memory pages are added into the into the uh, measurement of that uh, tvm and this is sort of the static part of the measurement so we want a clean break between when the, these initial pages are added and before the TVM can start running, you can't extend. We don't want that those measurements to be extended past that point, right? Now we we can think of supporting additional intrinsics once the guest starts executing. Um, sort of like the the notion of like TPM has dynamic PCRs. You can think of that being supported in addition by the TSM, where you know you have a set of static measurements that are cryptographic hashes over the over these static content and then additional measurements that are cryptographic hashes or things that are loaded by the TVM itself, right? So that, and then when you do annotation, yeah. That's actually why I ask. If you look at AMD's solution, pretty much just static. If you look at Intel TDX, it's static and dynamic. Yeah. Um, so it, it would it's important to think through how these are going to go together and turn into a real usable attestation solution. Yeah, uh, if you if you can just hold your thought for a minute, yep. I'm going to I have a slide on attestation, so I'll cover that in a bit more detail. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, so yeah, so just talking about the the sort of Linux KVM wrapping for the flow that um, I described earlier, right? Um, so hopefully this show, sort of shows like a build life cycle, right? For uh, uh, for KVM and what I've tried to do here is intersperse in the existing KVM flow where it would invoke these these different TSM intrinsics, right? So starting from the the top where the KVM gets the system capabilities to check, it'll invoke the get TSM info. When it's creating a, a, a VM through the KVM create VM operation, it'll set these these TVM parameters, right? This is basically choosing, you know, how many vCPUs, how much memory does it have, etc. Um, as it's assigning memory to the uh, to the TVM, it can assign shared memory directly, right? Um, but as it's assigning confidential memory, those get uh, get measured by the by the TSM. Um, oh, one one other important property I wanted to mention here is, as I was mentioning, that we want to also measure the GPA where the hashes of those contents are associated with for, for those pages and the, the second level paging structure, which is normally under the control of the of the hypervisor, is essentially managed by the TSM in, in, in this model, right? So so those second level paging structures are essentially allocated in confidential memory for the for the TSM. And this prevents certain classes of like memory remapping attacks um, so that the, the host can't come in and arbitrarily change a GPA to HPA mapping when the TVM is executed. Um, and then finally, it uh, before normally a VMM would just con continue executing here. It has to do this additional stage of finalizing the, the TVM so that its measurements are, are basically frozen. Um, and then it can start ex executing or scheduling through the through the additional SBI mechanisms. Um, yeah, and, and this picture sort of shows the, the conceptual model of, uh, you know, we want to reuse the, the, the H extension defined G stage page table, right, to essentially virtualize guest physical address space. And that's what is shown as the nested walk here, right? Uh, this is very akin to like other 
hardware virtualization architectures of whether you look at uh, AMD's implementation or uh, or Intel's implementation. Um, what is additionally shown here is this notion of the physical memory attributes being fetched right by by the hardware. So again, the how the actual memory physical address is trans converted to the physical memory attribute is implementation specific, but that the architectural property we want here is during these page walks, right? When the page walks are happening in the context of ATVM, right? We want the 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 specific properties associated with when confidential memory is accessed, right? Um, for example, the key fault conditions we want to enforce here is first, both of these paging structures would live in uh, confidential memory, right? The first one by definition, because it's it's built by the TVM code, by the TVM kernel, and it would always use confidential memory to, to build those structures. And second is enforced by the by the TSM itself by design, right? So as memory is added to the TVM, the confidential uh, memory is also used to create the, the second stage paging structures, right? And then the MMU or the CPU enforces the fact that while, while it's performing walks in the context of a CPU running in a TVM, which is recognized through a, think of it as like a microarchitectural mode of that CPU, it'll enforce that those walks are happening in confidential memory. And that is asserted by this uh, memory tracking table lookup, right? So every time a physical address is accessed during a page walk, the CPU knows the context of access and it knows the type of memory that it's, uh, it's accessing, right? So it can generate these new fault conditions where if these walks happen in non-confidential space or if, uh, if it's a uh, non-confidential access coming into confidential memory, which would be like the host accessing uh, a memory page, right? Or if it's a confidential CPU accessing, um, doing a code fetch, right? Or performing a page walk and they happen to access non-confidential memory, right? Those are the two cases for which we want to generate new faults out of the, out of the MMU, right? And that covers both the cases, whether access is coming from the non-confidential side or the host, or is coming from the confidential side for from a TVM, right? um, and those are the those are the basically the new new uh, fault conditions. Um, yeah, so I think I talked about the uh, non-zero of the the cleared memory addition. Oh, this is a good um, uh, sort of blurb to look at here, which ha has an implication on the uh, interfaces. So anytime a, a new map an, an existing mapping for a TVM is modified, we sort of have a uh, a new sequence defined here. Normally, a VMM would just do the, the the middle part, right? It would come in, it would modify the, it would ensure the vCPU is not running, it would modify the PTE mappings, and it would appropriately flush the the TLBs if the implementation has TLBs. Um, here, we want to make sure we are trying to keep the VMM outside the TCB, so we have to sort of guard band this functionality with a couple of additional intrinsics, right? One is to make sure, and and, and recall that uh, we said that the second level paging structures are under the control of the TSM, right? We want to make sure the VMM can't come in and arbitrarily tamper over the second level paging structures. So these guard band functions are used or provided by the TSM so the host can come in and invoke its desire to specifically change certain mappings, right? And that causes the, the TSM to ensure that certain mappings are blocked, right? And that essentially means that new TLB mappings can't be created using those mappings. Then we let the VMM perform whatever operation it needs to within, within, within reason of that operation. And then ensure that the VMM comes in and flushes the, the CPU threads, right? And that's again validated by the TSM. So we make sure that the, the right set of actions that happened around a set of changes that the VMM is attempting to uh, uh, enforce, right, on memory. And if this protocol is followed, okay. Uh, if this protocol is followed, then uh, we, we know that the the, the invariants are in place for the mapping structures. Um, so I just want to cover this one slide quickly on the attestation. There's a bunch of uh, attestation interfaces we also started um, discussing in the in the trusted computing sig that Samuel has been uh, um, you know discussing. And uh, uh, the question somebody was asking earlier, uh, this is sort of the way we look at the attestation model, right? In, in a nutshell, since we are running out of time, we want to basically use the TCG dice model to essentially build up the, the layers as, uh, as uh, there was a talk today morning that Peter described, Peter Gonda from Google, um, to build up the layers all the way to a TVM, right? Starting from some immutable hardware root of trust so that a verifier or relying party can essentially do a standard challenge response protocol, right? Um, and, and think of basically as the CDI is generated across these uh, dice layers, 
the TVM essentially ends up with a certificate chain that can prove its attestation, all that 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 proves this chain of uh, uh, TCB. Right. Um, that's again a ten. Yeah, we're done. Okay. Sorry. No, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. I'll I'll just leave it on this last call to action for you. Um, so you can join the the mailing list for uh, the work group. Uh, there's a POC for the TSM that uh, you know folks in, in Rivos have been working on. That's uh, that's online. You can you're welcome to go look at that. Um, and then uh, we'll continue this some of the KVM interface discussions online. Okay. Thank you.